ruins of Brooklands, the most famous track in the history of motor racing. From 1907 until the outbreak of the Second World War, this was the fastest and most exciting course in the whole world. Although originally made as a test place for new car designs, man's sporting instinct turned Brooklands into the motor racer's mecca. Every new mechanical and technological advance was utilized by those who devoted their lives to breaking records of speed and endurance. When men came here to duel against each other in the game of speed, the eyes of the world focused on the tournament. Huge fortunes were gambled on this track. Reputations were made and lost here by the motor industries and private promoters. While the men who drove the cars risked their lives for the pure glory of winning. Every schoolboy's idol was a racing driver. They were the heroes of their time, and their names became bywords for courage and daring. John Cobb, K. Don, George Easton and Malcolm Campbell. But for a few glorious years, one man's image shone more brilliantly than all the others. The daredevil sportsman who charmed the crowds, Captain Sir Henry Birkin, known quite simply as Tim. On a sunny day in June, the tranquil village of Blakeney on the North Norfolk coast hummed to the tune of Bentley Motors. They were arriving from all over the country for a very special gathering to pay tribute to the memory of Tim Birkin. This remote fishing village was very special to him. He loved to be on the nearby marshes at dawn to shoot wildfowl to sail in the estuary and race his speedboats in the sea. He loved the wit and friendliness of the local people, and he brought his wife here for their honeymoon. He insisted that on his death, he would return to be buried by Blakeney Church. So it was only fitting that those who have best reason to honor his name should meet here to remember him for his most famous exploits of all. Members of the Bentley Drivers Club were invited to come and be reminded of the important connection between Tim Birkin and their old vehicles. Over 40 cars made it. Most were Bentleys from the 20s and 30s, the period of greatest innovation and development in the motor industry. The favorites on show were the six which Tim Birkin himself had once owned and raced. Though these powerful record breakers were not designed for elegance, they still have their own rough charm. But Tim Birkin chose them because he wished only to prove that they were the best. Tim Birkin's first big race was at Brooklands in 1927. Yet only two years later, when he drove number 32 in the 500 mile race, he was already the most famous and admired British racing driver. He and his team were so devoted to their cars they were nicknamed the Bentley Boys. He was intensely patriotic and held a burning ambition to see Great Britain dominate both the English and continental circuits. The Italian car maker, Bugatti, described Birkin's Bentleys as the fastest lorries in the world, a reference to the British motor industry's unwillingness to develop a proper racing car which would compete with the foreigners. Maserati, Alfa Romeo, and Mercedes. And so to ensure that our trophies stayed at home. It is the triumph of those early days when Bentleys roared around the racetracks, which today's owners feel is so important to remember. After Tim Birkin's success with the Bentleys, he bought himself a foreigner, a supercharged straight eight Alfa Romeo in which he won the Irish Grand Prix in 1931. His earliest surviving sports car 
was the little two-seater ABC, which had previously belonged to his older brother. It was in this car that he got his first taste of the excitement of speed, while still little more than a boy. He was born in 1896, which meant that his formative years coincided with the Great War. He spent two years in the Royal Flying Corps, serving in the Middle East. His early life was typical of any dashing young man brought up in a wealthy title family at that time. The family money had been made in the Nottingham lace industry by his grandfather. When his elder brother was killed in the war, Tim became the heir to this fortune. In 1921, he married his beautiful bride, Audrey Latham. Soon after, his first daughter, Pamela, was born. And three years later, a second girl, Sarah, arrived. But he had already been bitten by the excitement of the racing circuit. He was rich enough to buy his own cars and compete in them wherever he chose. Nobody could fail to notice Tim's cool fearlessness. Even when he didn't win a race, he usually managed to break new records of speed and endurance, and he always won the admiration of the other drivers. Both Dr. Benjafield and Giulio Ramponi became his friends. In the 20s and 30s, Ramponi was one of Italy's top racing drivers. Though now 83 years old, when he heard about the Birkin Memorial, he came all the way from South Africa to remember the spirit of the competitors 50 years ago. There were sportsmen in that day. You, you beat, come here, you open something, open you something. The real sport. He saw you in the mirror, he waved you to pass. You were racing, you never asked the starting morning. You, you win the race for that medal. And you enjoy yourself, that's what you got. Drivers spent a great deal of time in the workshops. A team mechanic who knew Tim well was Wilkie Wilkinson. Very popular, you know, he always wore a blue scarf with white dots on it. I remember he used to flash out the back. Some, some people thought it was dangerous in case he got caught up somewhere, but he was a grand chap and a sportsman. If any car was a bit faster than he thought they could pass, he'd pull over off the top of the banking to let them through. But in general, it, after the race, you know, he was a grand sociable sort of fellow. Very, very impressive, very, everybody liked him very much indeed. Although Tim had been driving Bentleys since 1925, it was three years later that he commissioned a full race specification four and a half litre motor. That year, he raced at Brooklands, Le Mans, Nuremberg, the TT at Ards and Boulogne. But despite modest success in all those races, he was not satisfied that his cars went fast enough. So he opened his own workshop at Welling Garden City. He was determined to make his cars go a lot quicker than ever W.O. Bentley had intended. At vast expense, he developed a special supercharger known as the Blower. The designer was the engineer Amherst Villiers. Uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, um, he must have a supercharger, and I had supercharged uh, the Vauxhall um, for Raymond Mays, which we again broke the record of Shelter Walsh, and so he asked me if I would put the blowers on the Bentley. And so uh, I had a meeting with W.O. and uh, I had a contract which uh, said that my name would be on the blower and I could change the engine in any way. W.O. Bentley, on the right, did not approve. In his opinion, the supercharger would overstress the engine and undermine the Bentley reputation for reliability. Billy Rockle, the team mechanic, recalls that Tim knew what he was doing. He knew all about the engines because he used to, well, he used to build up small cars of his own before ever he joined the, uh, at Wellin, you know, at his home in um, Ruddington, near, near Nottingham. Nineteen twenty-nine, and Tim Birkin entered the legendary 24-hour race at Le Mans. He led a team of four Bentleys, co-driving with the diamond millionaire Wolf Bonato in the first speed six. Throughout the race, the Bentley team led. The other competitors hadn't a chance. 
W.O. Bentley was there to watch the race. When it became clear that at least two Bentleys would win, he said nothing. But the whole team came in. First, second, third, and fourth. Tim Birkin and Wolf Bernardo were victorious. They had driven 1,777 miles at an average speed of 74 miles an hour. A new world record. The Birkin team had done it. The whole world noted this triumph. Tim was everyone's hero. But he was curiously modest about his success. Whatever the rest of the world thought, the message from his admirers in distant Blakeney meant far more. He felt at home in Norfolk, where he could enjoy the other pleasures of his life. But he was seldom with his family. His racing commitments occupied so much of his time elsewhere though he always came up for the shooting season. His social life was a glamorous whirl. Good looks, breeding and charm gave him the status of a glittering socialite. Everyone wanted to know him. His friends loved him for his generosity and wild sense of fun. We had the most marvelous weekends. He told us, uh, say, oh, let's play rugger. And this was on the, in the big hall, you know. And then another time he'd say, oh, well, there's a full moon tonight. Let's go out to Blakeney and we'll shoot ducks uh, flying against the clouds, which, of course, you, against the full moon, you can do. A well-known local man who went with him was Billy Bishop. When he went to Chloe to my uh, to grandfather, I was always keen to go with him, and we'd be walking up Snipe. And uh, before you could say, there it is, it was dead. As I said, I used to think to, to think of Tim as not the fastest man in the West, the fastest man in the East. Uh, it, uh, Tim was uh, first coming over a wood, and, and behind us was a stable. And he said, Billy, I'll bet you a pound that I'll, uh, that I'll shoot a bird and put it through that stable door. Well, a uh, pound I hadn't done well got one the old days, but I, I bet him a pound. He hit the door five times, and he, and he put three inside the door. When invited to shoot in Scotland and Norfolk in the same week, he did both, as his sporting aide, Gordon Dawson, recalled. We went 45 miles of the shoot, shot gross all day. When we finished the last drive, he said, pack up when you get home. He said, we're, we're shooting at Frank tomorrow. Half past five in the morning, we arrived at Grantham. The, our, car, our car from Shadows was there to meet us. Uh, a big six Bentley, and took us down to the channel, which would be, be about, I suppose, 140 miles, I suppose. And um, had breakfast, and off we went to Fring. When we'd finished at Fring, the car was there and took us back to Grantham. So we had six days, first day in Scotland, second in Norfolk, and so on. Oh. 1930 was another busy year for Tim on the racetracks. In August, he was at Belfast, desperate to fight off a strong Italian team. He felt it was his patriotic duty, which is one reason the crowds loved him. Before any big race, he was intensely nervous and could hardly speak a civil word to anyone. Like so many great sportsmen, he was just a little superstitious. He always wore his spotted scarf. His dear friend, Dr. Benjafield, was in the same race though he knew not then how much he would depend on Benji in the future. In those days, the men who raced were a mixed bag of gentlemen. Though they were usually wealthy enough to support their sport, they raced for higher things than money. But the cost was enormous. A good workshop required a team of a dozen experienced mechanics who'd be prepared to work day and night until they dropped. And the team would have to be transported, housed and fed at a dozen different venues each year. To the spectators in that golden age of motoring, the life of the racing driver was nothing but glamorous. The crowds came for the excitement of seeing men flirt with death. Yet the greater the danger, the more modest was Tim Birkin, and his public loved him for it. But problems were looming. 
Tim's own financial resources had run short, and now he was being sponsored by the millionaires, Dorothy Paget. She was better known as an owner of racehorses, so buying Tim's cars was clearly an adventurous risk. Although he used all his vigor and experience to make her investment worthwhile, his luck had turned. Mechanical breakdown, a crash, and starting problems dogged every race. His days leading the winning team were over. At the end of the year, Miss Paget cut her losses and sold up the Birkin stable. All Tim's hopes of keeping a British team in the lead were dashed. The Bentley blowers were no longer his. W.O., having gone bust, had withdrawn from racing. Tim was bitterly disappointed and quite suddenly alone. His younger brother had earlier been killed on a motorbike and then his father died. But Tim's irrepressible urge to compete still burned within him. His skill as a driver was unchallenged. Italy's greatest promoter of car racing welcomed him in 1933. In May, he went to the Grand Prix at Tripoli in North Africa. Little did he know it was to be his last race. He was in a Maserati, the only car he still owned. He drove well and came in third. When the race was over, he reached over the car for his cigarettes and burned his arms on the red-hot exhaust pipe. He ignored this trivial inconvenience. As he sailed home to England with his arms bandaged, he was preparing plans to finance the next race. But the burns were already infected, and Tim became seriously ill. As Dr. Benjafield fought to save him, get well wishes poured in from his friends. An anonymous friend wrote, Come on, Tim, your chassis is still sound. Don't let carburetor trouble stop you. But on June the 22nd, 1933, Tim Birkin was dead. One man believed himself responsible. It was Giulio Ramponi who gave Tim the lead-based fuel which may have poisoned his burns. I blame myself. And of course, this accident, in that time, you know, you burn, they never bother to take a test of the blood. And uh, the lead been poisoning. Tim's last ride was back to Blakeney, just as he'd wished. His dearest friends came to flag him in. Earl Howe, Dr. Benjafield, and Sir Malcolm Campbell. The race was over. <laughs> Fifty years later, and Tim Birkin's daughter Pamela, now Lady Buxton, and her son, also named Tim, welcomed the present-day owners of her father's cars. <laughs> Lady Buxton gave special commemorative badges to all those devoted car owners who came so far to be at this historic meeting. Aha, this is blue, that's very unusual. Did you decide to change the colour? No, it's been this colour for many years. Has it? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You How drive kind this you. I do. Yes, yes I, I do. do. I enjoy it too. It's a real black and black. Yes. For all those connected with motor racing, this was a vital pilgrimage. Very much indeed. That's marvellous. It's splendid of you to come. Did you, you came on the your own here? Yes, we drove from uh, Alton Park yesterday oh, and back to London tonight and off to Le Mans tomorrow morning. So, you uh, came to Le Mans? Hmm. The Bentley Drivers Club laid on a luncheon feast which would have suited their great hero had he been there. Though not surprisingly, his presence was felt in spirit when a flood of memories was released by those who knew what sort of a man. Tim really was. I bet Tim Birkin would have loved your guard to shoot snipe in Ireland, don't you oh, think? Yeah. I bet he prob probably did. He did a, did, did a lot of wild fowling here oh, on the Blakeney coast. Oh, you did a immense amount of wild fowling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Extraordinary is <laughs> after 50 years, here we are acting just as though Birkin was still here, and that's exactly what the, what the locals do. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think those guys drove in races more with a sporting instinct than with a commercial instinct as you see it today. You no, know, ten years I was with him, but that was thirty in the ordinary life. Yeah, you know Johnny well. 
how many cars we got here. There's an extraordinary. Well, 40 odd. You see? When he asked, all, he asked him for some for meal, and he gave him curlew, curlew soup. So he said to Tim, well, did you like it? He said, that's very good, but shouldn't you have took the feathers off first? The president of the club was Hugh Harbin. Club. Whenever we hear his name, we get a sense of thrill, we get a sense of pride. Whenever we see his cars, we get the same marvelous sense of, of uh, thrill and enjoyment. And then we have an occasion like this when we even meet people who were cl much more closely identified with him than were we. And all of that compounds to make a very, very pleasant occasion. The famous cars then drove in solemn procession up the hill towards Blakeney Church, where Tim was buried. These were the cars which broke record after record of speed and endurance. These were the cars which once cluttered the pavements of London's West End when the Bentley boys got together for some fun. And late at night, it was a Bentley that Tim would drive full throttle to the Blakeney Marshes to shoot ducks at dawn. It was in these cars that he proved to the world that Britain was still great. And it was in these cars that Tim set the pace for all the rest to try and beat. Long after so many others have been forgotten, his name still carries the image of one to be admired. First, Lady Buxton placed her private memorial, a wreath of his favourite flowers, before Canon David Morris spoke a few words. We gather here to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Sir Henry, known as Tim, thanking God for his life so short and yet so full and for his great skill of driving and racing and the famous Bentley car. Billy Rockle, the Bentley team's loyal mechanic, and Giulio Ramponi, the fierce Italian driver, together presented a glorious floral tribute of the Bentley wings. Two wreaths were laid as planned, one from family, one from friends, when quite unexpectedly, Harold Whitlock, another of Tim's mechanics, stepped forward with the most affectionate reminder of Tim Birkin's character, his spotted blue scarf. It was indeed a very moving moment. It is 50 years since his death, yet he is remembered as though it were yesterday. I, I, when I tell I, I condemn myself to not to give that fuel, because the lead, it was a very bad poison, say, to burn. What really, really tells it all is he was known as Tim, even to the poorest of boy fellows, the poorest of boat, boatmen, everybody. A very popular day with all the other drivers, apart from, you know, a good sport, all around sport. If he, if he was beaten, he'd shake hands with you. <laughs> we, we took the grass more time than we took the road, but we did get round first. Sir Henry, he, you'd do anything for him. He didn't treat you as a son. He treated you as a friend. And he knew he could, always trusted you. He'd ask you to do something. He could always trust you. He knew it would be done. And mind you, he used to ask you to do some damn funny things sometimes. But, uh, that about we, we got through. The most debonair gentleman of the track lived only 36 years, yet he became a legend in his own lifetime. Mm -hmm.